Hello, and welcome to the Duke Endocrinology Conference. I'm Diana McNeil, Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled, Management of Graves Disease, and our distinguished guest is Dr. Jennifer Green, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Jennifer, what can you tell us about Graves' disease? Well, Graves' disease is uh, a fairly common problem, particularly in women, and it was described many, many years ago by uh, a Dr. Graves, thus the reason for the name of the disease. Which I've always felt Jennifer was totally inappropriate and have to be defined to patients when you describe the disease to them. You it, know? You know, it can be somewhat alarming, yeah. but it's, yeah. it, it's important to note that it's named after one of the doctors who first described the condition. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with the prognosis. Yeah. It's yeah. a very treatable condition. So uh, Graves' disease uh, is a form of hyperthyroidism that is caused by autoantibodies, so antibodies that uh, the body produces that stimulate the TSH receptor in the thyroid so that the thyroid continually produces excessive amounts of thyroid hormone. And uh, this is a picture of Dr. Graves. It's hard to know if he truly looked like that, but that's what he <laughs> yes, apparently right. looks like yeah. for, the medical, for the historical record. Um, People who are affected by Graves' disease have really the typical symptoms of hyperthyroidism that you would generally expect uh, in any patient with that condition, but they may have particular uh, physical manifestations that are unique to Graves' disease. For example, they could have very severe eye changes or mm. problems with movement mm. of the eyes or bulging or proptosis of the eyes that you don't see in other hyperthyroid conditions. Um, and they may have other signs on physical examination, like a brewy when you listen over the thyroid gland that you don't generally see in other hyperthyroid conditions. So if I was seeing a patient and I noticed that their eyes were bulging, does that automatically mean that they have Graves' disease, Jennifer? Or is it could it be a just, you know, just a normal physiologic change that their family has? Well, I mean, that's a good question. So um, many people do have an appearance that mm -hmm. makes you worry that they might have Graves' right. disease. Um, if it's something that truly runs in the family and a family member yep. can verify that they've always looked like that, it would be less worrisome. But at the same time, I've had patients who swore to me that their eyes always looked like that, right. who later on um, uh, had improvement in their appearance, and it was clear that it just must have happened so slowly that they didn't notice it. Yeah, I think one a good little practical hint is the driver's license test. Do you, you use that, I know. Yes, you know sometimes, what I'm, uh, sometimes the picture's so small you don't yeah, get sure. a good look That's at good the point. eyes. That's but, a good point. Uh, but certainly if they have noticed a dramatic change in their eyes or anyone has noticed a change right. in their eyes, that, that would be a good clue to good. the condition. Good. Um, uh, obviously, in patients who are hyperthyroid, the diagnosis is made by the finding of a suppressed TSH, and usually they have elevated levels of free T3 and free T4, although some people will only have an elevated free T3. Uh, we don't always need to check for the presence of the thyroid-stimulating antibodies in the circulation, but generally, if a hyperthyroid patient has positive thyroid-stimulating uh, immunoglobulins, it's pretty much diagnostic of Graves' disease. So, Jenna, for that laboratory that you call TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, you're saying that you don't need to check it all the time, or, or does that help guide your decisions regarding therapy sometimes? In the routine evaluation and management of a hyperthyroid patient, I would say that I do not generally check for those antibodies if I can make the diagnosis through other means, such as uh, physical findings that are diagnostic of Graves' disease, or if they have radiologic findings that are okay. consistent with uh, Graves. So many of our practitioners don't always have access to free T3 and free T4. They have access to some of these other labs like total T4, RT3 uptake, free thyroxine index. How do those labs correlate to the labs that you're talking about, Jennifer? Well, I think it, uh, in Graves' disease, what, what you're going to want to focus on, if those are the labs available to mm -hmm. you, would be the total T3 and total T4 levels in most situations. And those would be high, and the TSH, again, would be low in patients with 
hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease. So the take-home practical point is when you're looking at, at all the thyroid labs, always first start maybe at looking at the thyroid stimulating hormone or the TSH. Absolutely. And then and that will guide your hand toward at least thinking that something's wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> that's more than anything else. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If you're able to perform the radiologic evaluation to help define the cause of hyperthyroidism in patients with Graves' disease, if you do a nuclear medicine study, a radioiodine scan of the thyroid, generally the iodine uptake is diffusely increased throughout the gland, diffusely throughout the gland. So why do we use iodine as opposed to any other nucleotide? What, what, what's the special meaning of iodine in these scans? Well, the thyroid uses iodine to manufacture thyroid mm -hmm. hormone, and so if a thyroid gland is actively taking up a large amount of iodine, it's a good indication that the thyroid is continuously overproducing thyroid hormone, and that can help you differentiate hyperthyroidism from something like Graves' disease from a thyroiditis, for example, where the thyroid isn't continually making too much. So the difference, and this is an important consideration for some of our um, practitioners who might be ordering these scans, is that with Graves' disease, you're sucking up a lot of the iodine. Absolutely. And with thyroiditis, maybe you're just releasing it but not using any. Exactly. So the uptake might be super high for Graves' and undetectable for thyroiditis. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Now, now on this on this slide, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned doing a thyroid ultrasound. Yeah, and that's very different from yeah. what we've used to yeah. evaluate patients with Graves' disease in the past. But there is an emerging kind of consensus that ultrasound might be a better means huh. of diagnosing Graves' disease. And there is kind of a characteristic appearance where you often see that there is an increased vascularity, so increased blood flow throughout the gland. And the, uh, the gland tends to be hypoechogenic throughout. Hypo. Okay. Yeah. And, and, of course, you'd want to be keeping an eye out for things like thyroid nodules that might suggest a different condition or maybe a separate thyroid condition that would need to be evaluated separately. Yeah, that's a new um, uh, suggestion compared to the way yeah. a lot of us were taught about working up Graves' disease. Yeah, and, and, and it's kind of a nice idea because in many uh, medical centers, ultrasound might be a lot more readily available right. than a radioiodine right. scan. So it's a nice way to enhance your diagnostic process. Good. Good. Uh, the potential complications of hyperthyroidism are, are many. They're listed on the slide. Again, these are not necessarily exclusive to hyperthyroidism from Graves' disease, but we worry about loss of muscle mass, uh, loss of bone density, effects on the cardiovascular system, and then obviously people often feel unwell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can mm. be moody and anxious, mm. uh, and often um, really can it can really severely affect their day-to-day -day function, particularly if the condition's gone on for a long time before it's diagnosed. So one of the things that a lot of my female patients uh, in particular mention um, uh, when they are told they have Graves' disease in pregnancy is what you have on this slide about fetal hyperthyroidism. Right. I, you may be getting ready to talk about this later, but is that something that we can anticipate and hopefully prevent? I mean, a lot of moms are worried about that when, when they're told they have Graves' disease in pregnancy. Well, um, there are potential effects on the fetus, and I'll talk about that more a little okay. bit later. Um, and women, for example, who've been treated for Graves' disease and are no longer hyperthyroid aren't necessarily out of the woods. Ooh, okay. Yeah, because okay. the antibodies can still potentially affect the baby. But there are interventions that can help to ensure a healthier okay. pregnancy. Okay, uh, we'll look forward to hearing about that. And with respect to the treatment for Graves' disease, once you're fairly confident in your diagnosis, there are really three main categories of options for the treatment of the hyperthyroidism, and those include treatment with medications, mm -hmm. uh, radioiodine treatment, or surgical intervention, which is a little bit less, used a little bit less often, but certainly a reasonable option for treatment in some patients. And just to be clear, when you say radioactive iodine therapy, this is not the same process that you did when you made the diagnosis with radioactive iodine, is it? I mean, it's different, right? No, the substance that is used to do the scan and to do the treatment is the same, but okay. you use a very tiny dose to take the oh, picture, to right. take, do the scan and make okay. make the diagnosis. Okay. But you use much, uh, not much higher doses, but considerably higher doses if you're actually treating the hyperthyroidism. Okay. All right. Just as a general rule, um, beta blockers are always an option. Uh, they don't fix the hyperthyroidism, but what beta blockers can do is block the effect of the excessive thyroid hormone levels on the cardiovascular system and neurologic uh, systems. And so people can feel 
better very quickly if you institute beta blocker therapy. Um, people may be aware that a certain type of beta blocker called propranolol used to be recommended preferentially for um, this type of therapy yeah. in patients with hyperthyroidism, but it's not really clear that propranolol, although it can interfere with the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the biologically active form of thyroid hormone, it's not really clear that in most circumstances of hyperthyroidism that that really conveys a clinical advantage. So it really doesn't matter which one you use? It really no. doesn't. Okay, so here's a, here's a practical question sometimes that I think... Um, we may get confused in making this decision. You know, do, do all patients with hyperthyroidism need to be on a beta blocker? No. Okay. So if you are looking at a patient, how, again, would you decide if you need to use a beta blocker? Because you just told us that it blocks the, the peripheral conversion. It would make some sense that everybody might benefit. Well, uh, I usually decide on beta blocker therapy when I'm discussing with the patient how bad their symptoms are. Okay. If their heart's racing, their hands are shaky, they can't rest at night, okay. a beta blocker will, although it doesn't fix the problem, it can make them really feel better, rest better, um, get about their day-to-day -day activities in a more comfortable fashion, and it works very quickly. So it's really patient-driven by patient symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay right. Good. So it, it doesn't really affect how quickly they get better from the underlying okay. condition. Okay. Um, the mainstay of medical therapy for hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease are the thionamide class, so mm -hmm. methimazole and propylthiourosol, which is most commonly referred to as PTU. And these drugs work directly to decrease the amount of thyroid hormone that's produced in the thyroid gland. They may have some additional effects, too. Uh, some people think that these drugs have an immune, immunomodulatory mm. type effect, so they might, in fact, help to sort of suppress the overproduction of the antithyroid antibodies. Um, these drugs can be used short term to prepare patients for other definitive therapy like radioiodine treatment or surgery, or they can be used uh, longer term to try to achieve a remission. Yeah, we call it cooling off, don't cooling we? Cooling off, off. cooling off the patient. It's not that they're hot, but it's just I think right. they're just, you know, they might be, they hot. Might be they hot. hot. They might be hot, they might be hot. Right, right. Um, right. Are these drugs safe? Well, that's a very good question. Um, this first slide really show, t uh, kind of speaks to um, more of the pharmacokinetics of the drugs. Okay. My next slide reviews some of the important safety characteristics. Before we get to that, there are some important differences in the use of these drugs that people should know. Uh, the nethimazole has a longer half-life than PTU, mm -hmm. so it can be dosed less frequently, and often once a day is perfectly adequate. Uh, usually... Um, uh, you start at a fairly low dose, but you can start with more of a medium dose uh, for the given drug, depending on how severe the patient's hyperthyroidism is. Okay. With respect to PTU, it has a special feature of inhibiting the conversion of T4 to T3, so in a, an extremely hyperthyroid patient, uh, uh, or uh, it, that may uh, be important, but for the most part, both drugs work very well in treating hyperthyroidism. Uh, there are some studies that suggest that if you're going to treat a patient with an antithyroid medication before radioiodine treatment, that PTU might interfere a little bit with the effectiveness of the radioiodine therapy. Even if you stop it in advance of the iodine therapy? Well, the studies that have been done so far mm -hmm. suggest that there might be a slight difference. So this might be why we preferentially would choose methimazole. That would perhaps. be one. That okay. would be one reason. Okay. Uh, certainly, less frequent dosing is also very attractive. You um, had on that slide, Jennifer, something that I think a lot of people that work with uh, intensive care unit patients struggle with. These pills are pills. They, yes. There's no IV formulation for them. So if someone can't take something by mouth, what do you do? If it's very clear that they need to be on the medication, the medications can be administered rectally. Um, in some institutions, they've been given through other means like IV, but it's very, very difficult to prepare the medications to be given in that fashion. Okay. Uh, but those would be the most commonly administered okay. routes. Okay. Uh, with respect to the side effects, this is kind of getting back to the safety-related differences okay. and why you might choose one drug over the other. Uh, both drugs have the potential to cause problems like itching or hives, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, sometimes if a person has hives on, or a rash on one drug, you switch to the other, but there can be some cross-reactivity, so you okay. don't necessarily, uh, you can't necessarily guarantee that they wouldn't have a reaction. 
Now, there are some very rare but potentially mm -hmm. serious side effects listed on this slide, and mm -hmm. one of the ones that causes greatest concern is the potential for agranulocytosis, which is extremely rare. There probably is no good way to anticipate whether or not it's going to happen to a given person. I usually recommend that the patient be alert to the development of a severe sore throat, okay. sometimes with a fever. All right. That's usually the first sign that the white cell count is very low and they need to contact their healthcare professional right away. I think patient education here is really, really crucial because this is something that needs to be identified fairly quickly. It does. And then um, does it get better if you stop the medicine? Yes, uh, usually patients do have to be hospitalized though right. because they're at an increased risk for infection while the white cell count is low, okay. but there are interventions that can help to speed their recovery. So, so this is a question that I think endocrinologists sometimes uh, discuss from an evidence perspective. Is it important, in your opinion, to get a baseline blood count and or liver function test based on these um, side effects prior to starting these medications? And I then do you have to follow? I think it's reasonable to do that. Okay. Um, and a lot of the way that patients are followed up lab-wise is based on personal preference. Okay. I do not generally follow the CBC okay. routinely because it doesn't seem to predict very well who is going to develop a drop in That's your right. white cell count, but I'd like to have a baseline. Okay. Um, I do monitor the liver function test periodically in patients on these medications, however. Okay. okay. Uh, I do want to be alert to an early change okay. uh, if it's going to occur. And along the lines of uh, liver damage, one of the really important things to remember that can help us differentiate which of these drugs is preferred for a given patient is uh, the fact that there have been some very, very serious uh, liver-related complications reported in patients using PTU, particularly among children. Mm. Uh, and there have been instances of liver failure resulting mm. in death or requiring liver Trans transplantation. And mm. that does seem to be a significantly greater concern with PTU than with methimazole. And again, like you said, we use the big word idiosyncratic. We don't know when it's going to happen, so that's why you monitor the liver function. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. okay. Um, uh, the other important point on this slide, though, that might steer your therapy in, in a particular direction, we'll talk about this more later, too, is the fact, though, that PTU probably is safer during pregnancy. Uh, it's not known to have teratogenic effects, whereas methimazole uh, may be associated with an increased risk of fetal p development problems such okay. as aplasia cutis or esophageal atresia. It's not clear what the risk is to okay. the fetus in mothers who use this medication, but the risk is probably greater than with PTU use. I've also seen some of our OB colleagues use methimazole though in the first trimester if someone is intolerant to propothiuracil and then can't actually have surgery, but it's better to try to avoid it if possible. And the farther away you get, maybe you're safer. I don't know. It sounds like you might have well, less risk of the problem if you're out of the first trimester. Yes, absolutely. So we can't forget that the hyperthyroidism itself poses a risk ah, there you go. Uh, to both the mother and the right. fetus. So it's important that the hyperthyroidism itself be addressed. Ideally, PTU would be used to treat hyperthyroidism uh, in a mother prior to conception and for the first trimester, but yeah. it's reasonable to consider switching to methimazole subsequent to that. Yeah. I'm smiling because we keep going back to the thyroid disease in pregnancy, mostly yeah. because for a lot of us, some of the most severe cases of hyperthyroidism that we see occur in pregnancy because that pregnancy hormone makes, tricks the thyroid into working yes. over time, doesn't it? Yes. But we'll get back to it. You promise mm -hmm. us. Okay. Yes, we'll talk more about that. Okay. And just so that everyone is aware, the FDA has taken a very recent step of issuing an advisory related to okay. PTU use, and they have suggested that it not be the first-line drug for the treatment of hyperthyroidism unless, again, the patient's in the first trimester of pregnancy. I would probably also extend that to patients who are uh, planning to conceive okay. uh, because they could very easily end up on the drug during the first trimester and be unaware okay. uh, of the pregnancy okay. until they're about a month along. Uh, obviously, in patients who've had an adverse reaction to methimazole for whom other therapies such as radioiodine or surgery are not an option, PTU uh, would be a reasonable therapy. And in patients who have very severe life-threatening thyrotoxicosis or thyroid storm, 
PTU may be the preferred agent. Because of the block of the conversion. Exactly, exactly. But again, those are fairly rare circumstances. So the vast majority of individuals who present with hyperthyroidism probably should be treated preferentially with methimazole. Okay. Uh, in most individuals, if you're treating them in hopes of achieving a remission, the medical therapy is continued for about 12 to 18 months. It's not clear that treating people for any longer increases the likelihood of a remission. But I have some patients, Jennifer, that don't want to receive iodine. They just don't want to take iodine therapy. Is there harm in just leaving these patients who are stable on these methimazole or, or PTU for a long period of time? Well, that's a good question. Unfortunately, some of these um, adverse reactions are fairly idiosyncratic uh, and unpredictable. And so okay. some of the complications, particularly the very severe and unusual ones, um, may be more likely to happen if you just stay on the drugs indefinitely. For those of us that are starting to take care of a, a greater geriatric population, some of the side effects, I understand, are related in part to age so that you have an increased risk of, of liver problems, sort of like with isoniazid, mm -hmm. um, you know, the tuberculosis medicine as you get older. So mm -hmm. uh, we have to be careful. All, all we do have to be careful. There. On the other hand, though, people who are at an advanced age yeah. might be more reasonable candidates for prolonged medical therapy good because point. they might not tolerate the other therapies that's a good at point. all. That's, a, so, that's an excellent um, point. It does need to be individualized. The important thing to remember, though, is that even if your patient does experience a remission after a course of medical therapy, they're still a little bit more likely than not to have a relapse of the hyperthyroidism mm -hmm. at some point. Now, most of the time, the relapse occurs in the first few months after therapy is discontinued, but they need to be followed. How often would you check their thyroid labs if you were the primary care physician once well, they stopped the medicine? Once they've stopped, I would certainly check within the first few months. I'd probably check at three months, at six months, maybe at a year. Okay. And then if everything was going smoothly annually thereafter, the patient needs to be alert to the possibility that the hyperthyroidism could recur. And, and in my experience, patients who have a recurrence right. usually know right away because they've been through it already. That's They'll right. call and say, my hyperthyroidism is back. Right, right. And I they, need and to they see need. you. And, and most yeah. of the time when they come and see us in clinic, we know that they're hyperthyroidism. We know, we know. But usually they know first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of important things to remember that are listed on this slide is that patients who present with very severe hyperthyroidism or patients who have a very large thyroid gland may be less likely to experience a remission okay. with medical therapy. So that can help guide your choice early on. There are some other medications that in particular circumstances might be helpful in the treatment of hyperthyroidism. Sometimes iodine containing mm -hmm. preparations particularly can be used in for a short period of time in preparation for surgery or if a person um, needs to have their hyperthyroidism treated very, very quickly because they're very ill. Lithium is also a possibility. And interestingly, medicines like the bile acid binding resin, I actually, agree. isn't that I forgot fun? about that. I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Can, can uh, kind of suck the circulating thyroid hormone out of the uh, enterohepatic yeah. circulation. The image of it sucking it yeah, out of the is yeah. unique in itself. Yeah. Uh, what's recommended most often in the United States though, is radioiodine therapy. And it may be difficult to see on this slide, but I have listed in the box at the bottom how the radiologist decides what dose of radioiodine to give. It depends on the size of the gland and uh, the percent iodine uptake on their thyroid scan. Pretty picture. Isn't it? Yeah. There are some definite benefits to radioiodine therapy. Most people only need to be treated once. It's a definitive treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for people who are worried about the potential side effects of the antithyroid drugs, you may be able to minimize or completely avoid those concerns. But there are some risks, and I hate that the list of risks is so much longer on this slide than the benefits because really this treatment is very well tolerated by most people, and it's a terrific option for patients to consider. But most of the time, people who are treated with, if adequately with radioiodine become hypothyroid. Um, sometimes uh, people will have a worsening of their hyperthyroidism after the treatment that we need to be alert to. Okay. Um, and uh, there may be some other concerns, particularly uh, this is something that should be avoided in patients who are pregnant, who are breastfeeding, or women who plan to become pregnant in the so near future. do you need to confirm the absence of pregnancy. I'm assuming they do that before they get the iodine. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, you uh, need to advise the female patient that you don't want them to get pregnant 
or how long afterwards? Um, you know, some of the recommendations vary, but yeah. certainly six months. Six months. Certainly okay. six months. Some okay. institutions recommend a longer period of time. Okay. Uh, but six months is, is probably reasonable. Another couple of things you have to remember is they do need to have, they do need to take some precautions to avoid mm -hmm. the exposure of individuals that they work with or at home to uh, exposure to the radiation. And uh, in individuals who have moderate to severe eye disease related to Graves' disease that is active, right. uh, there is some concern that the radioiodine therapy might worsen that condition. So because it stimulates the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, and, or, or what does it do that makes the eyes worse? Well, that's know? a good question. I mean, I think it probably does. That's yeah, probably yeah, a yeah. component. I'm yeah. not sure we really understand. Yeah. And it's, a greatest, it's the greatest concern is in individuals with Graves' disease who smoke. They're right. at greatest risk. Um, but there are ways of performing this kind of treatment and, and protecting the eyes, usually involving a course of steroid therapy. Okay. All right. Uh, if your patient is on antithyroid medication before the radioiodine treatment, the drug has to be discontinued right. prior to treatment. We usually, usually advise that they stop the medicine about 10 days ahead of time. Some institutions only recommend about three to five days off, but it needs to be out of the system to some extent. Um, whether or not you restart the antithyroid drug after the radioactive iodine treatment is, again, a very individual decision. In a patient who's extremely hyperthyroid, you might consider uh, starting them back on their antithyroid medication after they're treated. But you can leave them on the beta blocker through the whole you, thing, right? Yes. Because yeah, that doesn't be, affect the iodine. It will not interfere whatsoever with the efficacy of the radioiodine treatment. Jennifer, you like these pretty pictures. I, I do. <laughs> I do. Again, if you happen to have the ultrasound information about your patient's okay. thyroid gland. A couple of things that might help you decide on uh, the best approach would be, again, if the thyroid is very large uh, on, uh, on ultrasound or if it's normoechogenic rather than hypoechogenic. Okay. That may suggest that they're a little bit less likely to respond to the radioiodine. Okay. So All there's right. a lot of things to keep straight, okay. but, uh, right. but we can learn a lot from these, uh, from these radiologic Does it images. Hurt? Patients ask that all the time. When I, when I take that iodine, is my neck going to hurt? I've had some people tell me that their neck was a little bit tender for a okay. few days afterwards. But, I, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be a major okay. problem. Okay. You may have had a different experience. Mm -hmm. but it's always patient-specific. Again, I think it probably relates to the size of the yeah, thyroid. I think, so. I think you're right. Yeah, the bigger right. it is, the more inflammation could occur. Uh, a couple things to remember about the response to the radioiodine therapy. It usually takes about two to three months for the thyroid levels to really fall and or for the patient to become hypothyroid, but they need to be followed very closely for the first few months after treatment. Another reason to think about maybe using medical therapy mm -hmm. first in the very hyperthyroid patient is that that's good. sometimes two to three months right. for the patient to feel better is an unacceptably long period okay. of time. So I used to think that if I buzzed a patient with iodine therapy who was really hyperthyroid that I could cause them to go into thyroid storm. Uh, has that been disproven? Do we need to worry about that less? Well, you know, it appears that that can happen, but it mm. happens very, very infrequently. Okay. Okay. Um, again, I'd be more concerned about patients with very large thyroid glands, okay. patients who are severely hyperthyroid, right. maybe patients who are older who there have other okay. serious medical conditions that could be exacerbated okay. by worsening of their hyperthyroidism, you may want to manage those patients a little bit more intensively right. with medication. Okay. This is just a, a list from a recent publication by Doug Ross that lists some of the precautions that people who've had radioiodine treatment should take or could consider taking at home uh, to protect other family members or coworkers from any ra excessive radioiodine exposure. Again, this is this varies to some extent by institution, and the patient should always follow the instructions given to them by the nuclear medicine physician who treats okay. them. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about surgery, okay. which uh, is not certainly not the most commonly recommended intervention for the treatment of hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease, but there are particular situations mm -hmm. in which it's a reasonable thing to consider. So, for example, if the patient also has thyroid nodules that are worrisome for malignancy. Okay. Uh, if they have a very large thyroid that's causing some obstructive 
type symptoms like difficulty swallowing or breathing, it's very reasonable to consider. And if the other kind of modalities of treatment are not options for the patient, uh, let's say they've had an adverse reaction to the antithyroid right. medications, yeah. uh, they have bad eye disease and don't right. want to run the risk of worsening uh, that with uh, radioiodine therapy, or certainly in the situation of pregnancy, we may need to consider surgery as a reasonable intervention. So you just maybe debunked uh, a medical myth, because I think for a lot of us, we thought if somebody was hyperthyroid, they could never have thyroid cancer. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no is right. Oh, no is right. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, um, you know, that's one of the nice reasons to get an ultrasound or to get a thyroid scan is you can be alert to the presence of thyroid masses or right. nodules that look different from what's happening in the rest of the thyroid okay. tissue. Good. So you can have both things. It's not common, but right. it can occur. Good. It can Good. occur. If a hyperthyroid patient needs to have surgery, they do need to be prepared mm -hmm. adequately. Uh, certainly, if they're having thyroid surgery, they need to be as close to euthyroid as possible uh, with the use of antithyroid medications. You can use beta blockers. You can use iodine containing preparations, lithium, really any of the medications that I've mentioned previously okay. to prepare them adequately for the operation. Okay. And just as a, an aside, um, in the olden days, people used to try to leave sort of a big part of the thyroid in the neck. Right so that maybe the patient would produce enough thyroid mm -hmm. hormone that they would have normal thyroid hormone levels. But it turns out the more you leave in the neck, the more likely they are to be hyperthyroid, either right after surgery or years down the line. So now they really try to remove almost all the thyroid tissue. I think as we got smarter about the cause of Graves' disease and understand yes. that it was autoimmune in some respects, yeah. we realized you can't leave anything there. I mean, you got to take Now, you've got four other glands behind that thyroid gland, though. Those are your yes. parathyroid. Um, I always teach that if you've got a line in your neck, that's the most common cause of hypocalcemia. Uh, so how do people take care of preserving the parathyroids? Well, I mean, obviously, it's very desirable in this situation for an experienced thyroid right. surgeon to do the operation. And you're right. They, don't, they, they leave a little bit of a remnant enough that those adjacent important glands right. Um, are preserved. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Good. And then we follow the calciums, I think, after surgery. Absolutely. The surgeon will al always check immediately after right. the surgery as well. So there are some special situations, some of which we've already alluded to right. a little bit. You and promised us you'd come back to the we'll talk about pregnancy. pregnancy. We've been waiting. Yes. We've been waiting. Yes. So for a patient who is hyperthyroid due to Graves' disease uh, in pregnancy or prior to pregnancy, um, the goal is to treat them with antithyroid medications so that the maternal free T4 is in the about at the upper limit of normal okay. for non-pregnant adults. Okay. And uh, the goal is to use as little medication as possible right. while at the same time controlling the hyperthyroidism adequately. Okay. Um, these uh, these medications do both cross the placenta, and that's good, both good and bad. Okay. Uh, but you want to minimize the amount of drug that's used All right. um, and, and not overdo. And again, we've already talked about uh, the preferred use of these medications during the various stages okay. of pregnancy. Now, sometimes uh, individuals who are pregnant need to have thyroid surgery to treat their hyperthyroidism. Again, that's fairly uncommon, uh, but it might be a consideration if a person has not tolerated the antithyroid medications uh, or if you can't control their hyperthyroidism adequately with the antithyroid drugs and they, they end up on very high doses or need to be on very high doses, it would be reasonable to think about surgical intervention. So, Jennifer, this is probably does not have a right answer, but this is a common medical uh, conundrum. So, some women, when they're in the first trimester of pregnancy, will have that condition called hyperemesis gravidarum. They are throwing up all the time. Uh, and when you check the thyroid labs, they look abnormal, and in fact, they look hyperthyroid. Tell us practically how you address whether or not they really have Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism, or is this just the function of the pregnancy hormone, which looks exactly. like the thyroid is Exactly. Exactly. So, so, exactly. so, so I'm close to it. I'm not, I knew that. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So it can be really difficult to tease it out. Okay. Um, and to be perfectly honest. All right. But again, I tend to look for those special features of Graves' disease in okay. a woman who has 
hyperthyroid labs um, early in pregnancy. So the eye changes, All right. uh, the brewy when you listen to the thyroid gland, certainly a family history of That's thyroid problems. Um, and you might consider checking the TSI, the thyroid stimulating okay. immunoglobulin level. Okay. That may help you decide whether or not it's something that is going to resolve on its own right. uh, w within the first trimester, at the end of the first trimester, or it's going to be a continuing problem throughout the pregnancy that requires different management. Okay. Boy, I, uh, I can't tell you, uh, there's been more than one time when you have to make a clinical call based on your, your perception of whether or not the patient has thyroid disease. And I think your ultrasound's a good idea, too. I, I think, think the, yeah, the ultrasound good, good idea might the ultrasound. be very Coming helpful. Back to the ultrasound. Yes, of course, because so, you can't do the radioiodine right. scan. So it's right. a very, very useful tool, right. I think. Right. Now, I don't know uh, exactly what the thyroid is going to look like in hyperemesis gravidarum, and there might be a little bit of That's overlap. True. So That's we true. need to make sure we understand that we you know, what, know what we're looking Good at point. if we're trying to make a diagnosis in that way. Uh, in women who have uh, Graves' disease, including women who've been treated in the past and might be euthyroid during their pregnancy, it's still important to know if they have circulating levels or elevated levels of the TSI. And I think we need to emphasize for our audience that this is a relatively new uh, guideline. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I can remember back in the beginning when you and I were first starting out in this business that we weren't checking these TSIs right. regularly. Right. Now it's uh, almost standard of care. It is now. standard of care yeah. and it needs to be checked either prior to conception or at some point prior right. to the second trimester. They are, the TSI are IgG, they cross the placenta and they have the potential to affect the fetal thyroid uh, and cause hyperthyroidism. So you have a woman who's been treated with either iodine or is in remission. Uh -huh. You check her TSI in pregnancy and it's positive. But she's been euthyroid. So what do you do with that? She's been euthyroid. I mean, that's an excellent question. Um, I think what I'd want to do, first of all, is make sure that there is an experienced maternal fetal medicine specialist yeah. involved. But that is a situation in which a, the fetus needs to be followed very, very closely. They need to have uh, very comprehensive ultrasounds performed uh, later on in pregnancy to assess the size of the fetal thyroid to see if there are any signs that there might be fetal hyper or even hypothyroidism. And you might consider treatment with an antithyroid medication if it appears exactly, okay. even though the woman herself is euthyroid. Okay. But it can be very, it can be a, a complicated and tricky situation to uh, to sort out. Uh, of course, and, and this is the case in most states, uh, babies who are born to women with uh, Graves' disease need to have their thyroid function checked, checked. immediately. Okay. And some uh, babies born to mothers of women, uh, born to mothers with Graves' disease, actually have hyperthyroidism due to the circulating. Uh, TSI for several months mm. after they're born, so they need to be watched very closely. And managed by a pediatrician who is yes. aware of the situation. Absolutely. And just as an aside, uh, the use of the antithyroid drugs during breastfeeding is considered acceptable. Okay, that's wonderful news and yep. important. Yep. Just a brief comment about Graves' ophthalmopathy. Uh, fortunately, most people with Graves' disease do not have severe mm -hmm. eye changes, okay. but it can happen and it's somewhat unpredictable as to who's going to be affected okay. and what the actual course of the eye changes would be. Smokers are at greatest risk, so anybody who has Graves' disease who smokes should make all efforts to certainly cut down or preferentially quit smoking. I used to not understand why, but you know, smoke, a cigarette has about a million ingredients in it, and one of them is thiocyanate. It's sort of like a iodine-stimulating uh, compound, and uh, you're right. I mean, it is hard to, to get people who smoke. Uh, cured from their Graves' disease sometimes. It yeah. is. Very it hard. is. And Very particularly hard. if they're feeling bad from hyperthyroidism, right. that may, it may be a, a difficult sell. Absolutely. Um, but, but I have found that sometimes it's a, it's a really good motivator. Um, again, radioiodine therapy is a concern in patients with moderate to severe Graves' disease. So if, but if that is considered the preferred treatment for a given patient, a course of steroids right. can help to protect the eyes from any adverse reactions related to the radioiodine therapy, okay. so it's still an option. Okay. This is just a, a flow chart um, that was prepared by a group in Europe uh, suggesting ways of managing individuals with ophthalmopathy, how to follow them, 
what kinds of interventions might be helpful. And we don't have time to get into this today, but if anyone's interested, there are good resources out okay. there. And the last table that I want to show is, again, something from Doug Ross's very recent publication in the New England Journal. And he's done probably the best job I've seen at kind of um, spelling out all the potential concerns um, and special situations mm -hmm. related to the treatment of hyperthyroidism and kind of outlining what the preferred therapies might be Good. for a given uh, individual case. It would be a great resource, I it think. It would be a terrific resource and something that I'll probably look at. Again, I'll just mention very briefly the fact that thyroid yeah. storm Ooh. can be a complication of Graves' yes. disease, and it, fortunately it's very, very rare, but it's really frightening when it occurs, and it has a, a not trivial mortality rate. The key, I think, for most of our listening audience is just to be alert to the possibility that a patient might be experiencing thyroid storm. And uh, usually it would occur in a patient who had hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease, who had some type of an underlying insult yeah. like an infection, and right. they had an operation, Hard. or maybe they just stopped taking their antithyroid drugs. Which um, is not always infrequent because I think we forgot maybe to mention Propothiuracil comes as 50 milligram tablets, isn't that correct? Yes. And so if you've got someone taking 100 milligrams three times a day, that's two tablets, two tablets, two that's tablets. That's a lot to be, remember. And, and for some patients, that's an adherence issue. Yes, and absolutely, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And for financial reasons absolutely. or just forgetfulness, sometimes people will stop taking the medications. And most people don't go into thyroid storm, but uh, it can happen. And uh, just so that uh, individuals are aware there is kind of a nice scoring system that can help us figure out, is a patient in thyroid storm or are they just really hyperthyroid? And right. so there are some tools that can help us to figure that out. And those scoring um, tables are used, I think, a lot of the time by um, hospitalists and others to decide if a patient needs to be in the intensive care unit or can be managed sometimes on the floor. Absolutely. In a, but for most of the, the outpatient doctors, if you're not sure, those patients need to go to the emergency they department. They do. Really, I they think. do. They do. And, yeah. and this is a situation in which an endocrinologist should always be involved with okay. the patient's okay. care. Since you brought it up, um, should an endocrinologist always be involved in the care of all patients with Graves' disease? I Biased question, I know, asking an endocrinologist that. But <laughs> yeah, I think um, it, it, it is. Uh, this is a, a condition that... Um, I think does require a certain level of expertise mm -hmm. in order to make sure that the patient's course is as smooth as possible. I think when the disease is initially diagnosed, that's the time that it's most important for an right. endocrinologist to be involved. However, if a patient has had their radioiodine therapy, their hypothyroid, yeah. and their management really consists just of thyroid hormone replacement, right. there may be a time when the subspecialty care is really no longer necessary. Good. Good. And just as a final note, uh, there are some studies going on at present to see if there are any ways of uh, enhancing the type of care that we can already provide to patients with hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease. So people are looking at whether or not various uh, therapies with monoclonal antibodies mm. might be helpful, both in the treatment of the hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease, but particularly in the treatment of the Graves' ophthalmopathy. Um, uh, there are some uh, individuals looking at whether or not different uh, doses of radi radioiodine therapy might be preferred uh, in the treatment of uh, Graves' disease and whether or not, in fact, steroid injections into the thyroid Ooh. might be an option. Whoa. And you, you have on your slide a wonderful website that um, patients and physicians can go to uh, the WW. Um, the clinicaltrials.gov trials. website. Yeah, clinical it it may not be tremendously user-friendly, but it okay. is a good resource good. Uh, for looking at trials for which patients might be eligible. Jennifer, this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Our guest faculty today has been Jennifer Green, one of my colleagues here at Duke. Jennifer, thanks again for joining us, and I really enjoyed our discussion today. And thanks for inviting me. Until next time then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Diana McNeil saying thanks for joining us and take care.